Um, so our next speaker is uh, is Mike Snyder. Um, as you've heard, he's a, a last minute fill in for uh, Jared Younger, but um, Mike is not usually the guy who fills in last minute for somebody. Uh, Mike is usually the guy you book a year or two years in advance, and somebody might have to fill in for him because he's very overcommitted. But we're really, really grateful that he's he's been able to uh, to join us here. Uh, Mike is the chair of genetics uh, here at Stanford University. He's also um, the director of genomics and the genomics and personalized medicine center uh, here at Stanford. Um, so it's uh, really a delight to have him here to share his research with us today. Well, it's a it's a delight that uh, we have uh, Mike here. Um, uh, we come from a very uh, common background, and that is that uh, surprisingly, we both had the same PhD advisor decades apart, <laughs> um, but at Caltech. And uh, so, since he's from Caltech, he's by definition a nerd. Um, <laughs> In fact, the nerds are going to make you well, just to let you know. <laughs> um, Mike was recruited here to come to Stanford to, uh, to chair genetics and from, from Yale. And um, he's done actually a remarkable job. And we've had some good chairs in the past, and they've made the department better. But he has, I think, now made the Department of Genetics at Stanford the best genetics department in the world. And they've constantly won those kind of positions. And if you see how he operates, uh, I think you could understand why. He's incredibly encouraging to the students. He worries about the students, everybody in the department, the faculty and everything. He doesn't really tell them what to do, but he enables them. And uh, that's why it's such a good place. Uh, and uh, what you always want to look for is somebody that's overcommitted. Uh, and Mike is definitely overcommitted. <laughs> um, it's about 2x overcommitted. Um, anyways, uh, it, it's delightful to have him here. Um, uh, we think very much alike, and I'm trying to get him into working on MECFS. We got a little bit of, of uh, his committed time to, to do this, and I'm hoping to get a lot more. And so he's going to talk about some of the things that we think may really help the patients. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ron. Ron is actually my scientific, um, I guess, father, and we come from, as he said, a scientific, my scientific grandfather. So he's built my, that's all mixed up. Anyway, all right, so, um, I'm going to tell you about uh, using big data, wearables especially, and, and how this can, we think, be used for monitoring health, and I think can also be used for better understanding disease. And as Ron said, we're actually starting to apply some of these technologies to chronic fatigue syndrome. All right, so let me find the... Great. All right, so I'm sure all of you are aware your health is affected by many, many things. Your, your DNA is part of this, but there's lots of other factors as well including, obviously, your environmental exposures, pathogens, chemicals, food, stress, exercise, all these impact your health. And we're now in a position where we can quantify all these, at least to some degree. Some of these technologies are pretty clunky, but some of them are actually getting more and more refined. Uh, and not only that, we can actually study the impacts of some of these things on people by making these incredibly detailed measurements, and that's actually what I'll be talking about today. And this is possible because I'd say there's a revolution in all kinds of technologies going on where we can collect t t data, very high dimensional data, and actually use it to be monitoring people's health. So probably the one that gets the biggest splash is being able to sequence people's DNA and your microbiome and things like this, and that's the top one up there. But also there's a revolution not as well appreciated in mass spectrometry. These are the machines, the simple versions are at, in airports. Uh, you know, detect when you have a bomb, those chemicals there, that's a mass spectrometer. Uh, but the ones we use actually cost a lot more and detect many, many more things. You can actually measure thousands of molecules, so metabolites and lipids out of your blood and urine. And then I would argue there's a wave going on in now using wearable devices. It's something we're pushing to try and measure people's uh, physiology and other measurements continuously, which we think will be extremely powerful. So a number of years ago, actually when I came to Stanford, about 10 years ago, we did a lot thinking about 
systems uh, use, using lots of measurements to try and understand systems. And we wanted to actually see if we could start applying this for medicine. Because I think the way medicine is done now is entirely Byzantine, actually. I think we can transform this completely. So the idea is that we would actually use all these different, they're called omics technologies, where your genome is all your DNA, as you know. But we can make lots and lots of other measurements. So you'll see the word transcriptome up there. That means all your RNA. We can follow all these different components in your blood in incredible detail. So we'll follow your RNA, all your proteins, that's a proteome. Uh, your cytokines, as you heard from Maureen, those are your immune modulators. Uh, we can follow those. Your metabolites and your lipids, we follow this out of your, most of this is out of your plasma, but also out of your immune cells called peripheral blood monocyte cells, and so on and so forth. We follow your microbiome. Um, and why do we do this? We think all these things are interrelated. Your metabolome, your immune system, your, your actually epigenome, that's modified DNA. They're all interrelated, and by following all of this, we think we can get a better understanding of what's going on when you're healthy and what happens when you transform to disease. And so what we want to do, obviously, is apply some of these to chronic fatigue syndrome, and that's how we're collaborating with Ron. Fresh here is actually leading uh, that effort on our side. Uh, I should say we also do lots of other measurements. We do clinical testing, uh, questionnaires for stress, things like that. And we do some advanced tests like stress echo, cardiograms. And I didn't say, but a lot of the folks were now following roughly 109 people. We've been doing this for about seven years. We started this about, I guess, nine and a half years ago. <clears throat> uh, and we're actually following this cohort of people. They're mostly focused in the area of uh, type 2 diabetes, because it turns out I'm type 2 diabetic, which is figured out from my genome initially. Uh, and so we're looking at things like oral glucose tolerance tests and some resistance. So we're, we've got these people very, very well phenotyped for glucose control. And then we also have wearable devices we put on them starting about six or seven years ago. So anyway, we've been doing these deep profiles and seeing what, we can, what can we learn about people's health. These are generally healthy people. About 10% are type 2 diabetic and another um, 30, 40% are actually pre-diabetic. And so by following these folks just for three years, it turns out it's an older cohort, 53.4 years old. We actually found 49 what we call major clinical discoveries, things that are important for managing people's health. And they fall in these broad areas. So there's the metabolic one up in the upper left. Those are um, discoveries we made that were important for people's health. Like we found two people were diabetic who had no idea. And actually, we found many people are pre-diabetic. Turns out nine out of 10 pre-diabetics have no idea. I guarantee a lot of you are pre-diabetic and have no idea. Uh, and you can now follow those pretty easily. But we also found things in the cardiovascular space hemo oncology space, like one person with early lymphoma. We caught that by, uh, from imaging in a large spleen and some blood markers that went up. Two people with precancers, even people who had anemia, uh, thalassemia, basically, uh, and so on and so forth. So we actually made quite a few different health discoveries. We think these same technologies, again, can be used for chronic fatigue, and so we're now applying them. And so Fred has been collecting samples from some like 300 and some odd families, over 1,000 people. And the plan is to profile these with this deep technologies, and we're collaborating with Ron on this. What I thought I'd do, though, is just focus on one part, because I want to tell you about a study we're trying to roll out that you guys are welcome to participate in, so a little bit of solicitation here. And this involves the use of wearables. So many of you know, just out of curiosity, how many of you are wearing a smartwatch right now? OK, quite a few. Great. All right. Well, we'll see if that turns out more later. So there's actually, believe it or not, over 900 wearable devices on the market these days. So it's a whole slew of these things. And they measure all kinds of different things. And we've tested about 40 of these uh, for accuracy, for ease of use. And the hardest thing is actually getting the data, the raw data. Uh, and we wound up settling on several. In fact, uh, the, I guess we settled on about nine of these devices that I use. So. In fact, you may notice I'm wearing three smart watches. This thing is the only thing, this is the only thing that's not measuring anything. So in the future, we should give a band that actually measures things. Uh, uh, and this ring, by the way, is not a ring. It's a sensor, of course. Uh, so these things can measure all kinds of things, heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, sleep. Uh, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. Uh, skin temperature, even conductance on your skin. 
There are even devices for measuring radiation. So I have a radiation monitor here, which I forgot to look at. We can tell you exactly what the high energy radiation is in this room. Okay, it's, uh, it's about the same everywhere, three millirems per hour. That's not bad, by the way. Just lost my credit card. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then you can measure, this is one we've been developing, I won't have time to tell you, but it's actually an exposometer. It's measuring all the biologicals and all the chemicals we're getting exposed to right now, which you have no idea what they are. I don't either, but we'll go take it back to the lab and figure it out. Okay, so we can actually now measure all kinds of different things. And so what I want to do is show you how we use these, and I think you'll see why they're, I think, going to be valuable for measuring chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome. So this is the kind of data you can get from this. So you can start getting, pe capturing people's baseline data at different times of the day. So the top is sleep, middle is heart rate, and bottom is skin temperature. So you can see on the left, this is a circadian pattern, meaning across 24 hours. So you can see I sleep at night, wake during the day, occasional nap, that little bump in there, back to sleep at night. Then heart rate's low at night, high during the day, back down, skin temperature, for most people, it's high at night, drops in the day, comes back up. A little bit different from your oral temperature. And, but these are the patterns you can collect. Uh, that's me. This is 43 other people. We put these on hundreds of folks. Everybody has a different baseline heart rate, skin temperature, blood oxygen, what have you. And so the name of the game, the way we use these for monitoring health, is to try and find deviations from this pattern. Oh, I forgot one other thing. This is people's activity patterns. You can start classifying people by their activities. So the one in the upper right are people who are generally monotonic, meaning you know they're not active at night, but then they're doing some activity during the day. The one in the top left, see there's a single hump. Those are people who are active in the morning. Uh, the one in the bottom left are people who are uh, active in morning and afternoon. And the one at the bottom right is morning, afternoon, and evening. So you can start classifying people by their activity patterns and, again, capture all this information. So the, again, the way we use this then is to find deviations from this. And so it turns out by following me, I've been wearing these devices for about seven years now, you can start seeing where the differences are. And so for me, one of the biggest differences, you heard already, I travel a lot. And it turns out, so one of the biggest differences is my blood oxygen drops on airplanes. This is known already, actually. It's not that well known but your blood oxygen drops on airplanes, and it turns out you can measure, uh, your, it's because you're at the air pressure drops on, on cabins, right? You know that, but what you may not know is you can measure exactly what it is with this app that's free on your phone if you have an iPhone. It's called Barograph. You can download it right now for free, and it'll tell you exactly what the air pressure is in an airplane, and it differs for different airplane types. So 737s actually drop the most, as do Airbuses, and then some of the others don't drop as much. And capture all this, measure it exactly. And so it turns out, as I say, this is known, although what's not so well described. So that's actually a flight, by the way, um, from San Francisco to San Diego. So green is altitude, plane goes up, comes back down. That blue is my blood oxygen. Starts out high, drops low, comes back up. That's true for that flight. It turns out it's true for virtually every flight. Um, uh, I'm adapting a little bit now for reasons I can explain. All right, what's not so clear in the literature is just how low is it and how, you know, how often does it say really low. And it turns out about 5% of the time I'm 90 or below in my blood oxygen. Most of the time I'm around 93, 94. Um, so, and that is relatively typical, but it turns out it's all over the map. So first of all, everybody with one exception drops their blood oxygen on airline flights. Okay, and so this is, I think, 18 different people. Uh, we've measured now 50 or more. As I say, only ever one exception. People really do drop their blood oxygen. What I'm not so clear about, and talking with a few of you both today and over the last few days, I'm hearing that a lot of chronic fatigue syndrome folks actually have severe problems. So I don't know if this could be a good assay or not. Put people under a little bit of hypoxia and see if they drop more. Maybe it is. I don't know. How many of you actually have a lot of trouble on airplanes? Yeah, quite a few. So maybe this could be a good and rather rapid assay, actually, for figuring out, you know, if, what your symptoms are and if you're getting better or worse. So it could be something worth trying. By the way, this is done with a very simple device. I have several here. I can show them to you. You can measure for yourself. What's also not in the literature that you can't find is what does it mean? 
What's the big deal out of all this? Well, it turns out we found it correlates with fatigue. So for me, you can do a blinded test, and if the blood oxygen drops below 96, I classify myself as tired, and if it's 96 or above, I'm alert. So red is alert, doesn't matter whether I'm on, in the plane or on the ground, the 96, so 96 is my threshold. Again, it's an arbitrary um, uh, subjective definition to call what's tired, what's alert. But you can also do a reaction time test. That's a lot more quantitative. So visual test, see a dot, react to it. And basically, your reaction times are faster when your blood oxygen's up, and they're lower when it's down. That could be another very simple assay, perhaps, for MECFS. I don't know. That's something we could explore, but it's very, very simple to execute. And then again, you could see if people are getting better or worse. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting we discovered, so for me, by the way, this is extremely disappointing news because I'm a workaholic, as you may have figured out. And so what that means is um, when you go on an airplane, right, the reason you get tired isn't because, um, you know, you've been working too hard or anything like that. It's because they drop the air pressure, your blood oxygen drops, you get tired. We're pretty sure that's what's going on, not that you've been partying too much or things like that. Uh, and so again, if you're a workaholic, that's very disappointing news because you can be all fired up, ready to get work done on a plane ride, and as soon as you go up, boom, you'll get knocked right out. So it turns out, though, there, on long flights, that you, there's a solution, which is hang in there because you can adapt. And the mechanism for this really isn't clear, at least not to me. That's a flight from Frankfurt to uh, San Francisco. And what you'll notice, blue again is my blood oxygen. It starts out high, drops down low, but after seven hours, pretty reproducible for me, I'll come back to fairly normal levels. So again, we don't really understand. You're not making more red blood cells or things like that, so it's not 100% clear what's going on there, but that would be kind of interesting uh, to figure that out. All right, so why is all this, um, this is amusing about airline flights, why is this valuable in other contexts? Well, it turns out, uh, I got Lyme disease, and the way we figured this out was actually by a simple pulse ox, the sort of thing I was telling you, that measures blood oxygen, as well as actually a smartwatch. So it turns out, as I say, as you probably figured out, I measure my blood oxygen on every flight. I've done it now for probably getting over 600, maybe more flights. And basically, we know exactly what my, is going to happen to my blood oxygen on a typical airline flight as a function of air pressure. And basically, as I was flying to Norway through Frankfurt, I discovered um, that my blood oxygen was abnormally low. Now, I forgot to give you the backstory here. Uh, two weeks before this flight, I was helping my brother put up fences in rural Massachusetts where 55% of ticks are Lyme infested, uh, and then was flying in two weeks later to Norway. It's so on this last flight from Oslo to, Fra or, sorry, from Frankfurt to Oslo. So it's a fairly, um, uh, low altitude flight, so the pressure doesn't drop much. Uh, and my blood oxygen, because I measure myself a lot, I know how far it should drop. And green is how far it should drop. It should drop down to about 95, 96, and it always bounces back when you land. Well, in this flight, I was abnormally low. My median blood oxygen was 90, and when I landed, it didn't come back up. Not only that, my heart rate was elevated, which I could see on the smartwatch, and that stayed elevated. And then I later looked, that's shown here. So my heart rate was up. This is kind of looking at daily averages now. But basically, my postdoc did this nice and schematically. You can see when I was bit by the tick. Um, and basically, uh, that first little spike is when I was flying to, Nor to Norway. I later learned my skin temperature was elevated as well. Okay, it's only up about two beats per minute, but that's enough to pick up pretty easily because these devices make about 250,000 measurements a day. So really ma making lots and lots of measurements. So anyway, then I later got a low grade fever. I went to a doctor in Norway and I warned him it might be Lyme because of the timing. Uh, he did in fact pull blood and said, yep, my monocytes are up. You've got some sort of bacterial infection. You should take penicillin. I said, no, I should take doxycycline because that's what you do for Lyme disease. <laughs> As you might imagine, there's a little bit of a standoff there for a few moments there. <laughs> Doctors don't really like to be told by their patients uh, what they should be taking. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a crowd that appreciates us, yeah. So anyway, uh, he finally did give in, and I was about to go above the Arctic Circle, so the last thing I wanted to do was be sick while well, this is going on. So he gave in, gave me doxycycline, it cleared right up actually within 24 hours, although you take it for two weeks. 
And when I got back, I measured uh, myself for Lyme, and I was positive both for the antibodies and even some antigens were around. And it's a well-controlled experiment because just before I left, see that negative sign there? I'd given blood that day as well, so we could actually analyze that sample. I was negative then, so I'd see her converted during that time. So the bottom line is a very well-controlled experiment. Very clear I got Lyme disease and that the doxycycline um, cleared it up. But what was cool was that we could capture this with a simple pulse ox and a smartwatch, right, which is pretty cool. So that led us then to look at, I'd been wearing this watch for about two years, as have other people in our study. So we went back and looked at the two years of data, and it turns out there were four times when I was sick as measured by a marker called CRP. One was the Lyme disease time, and the other two times were a viral infection. The fourth time I actually didn't report being sick, but I did have elevated CRP, which means I probably was sick and didn't know it. And so the bottom is the, you can do this by outlying measurements. How many two high measurements do you have? And so the bottom, the, what's called the x-axis, is heart rate and skin temperature is the y-axis. And it turns out every single time I was ill, I have elevated heart rate and skin temperature, which is different from my healthy times. So that means every time I'm ill, I can pick that up with a smartwatch. So what we did was we wrote an algorithm. We call it change of heart. It doesn't work well for skin temperature because I don't think most people wear their watch tight enough, actually. But it does work for me. So anyway, every time I was ill, we can pick up when I'm ill before I realize it because I have an elevated heart rate. Okay, so your heart rate goes up. The, all you need now is a 30-minute window, resting heart rate, I should point out. I think it'll work better for walking heart rate. But right now we've set it up for resting heart rate. We can tell when you're getting ill because your heart rate goes up before you're symptomatic. And same is true for there are three other people, one of whom got sick twice. Same thing. We could see where that little peak shows up. That's a delta plot, if you will, to when you first can see that something strange is going on. Uh, and so again, we think we can pick this up. So we think we can tell when you're getting sick from a simple smartwatch just by the elevated heart rate. And so the plan is to test this out in a bigger study where we're, we're now, we have an IRB approved study to follow a thousand people to see if we can tell when people are first getting sick with an acute illness. Now we also want to measure this for people who have chronic disease. So we have an, um, oh, I'll save this for, maybe I'll skip, how much time do we have? Okay. Um, yeah, maybe, well, I'll just, <laughs> I'll throw out one little side story. I got ahead of myself. We're also measuring glucose, as I mentioned, other things as well. I think the glucose would be very, very interesting to follow in this particular group of people because it's pretty clear there are glycolytic changes in, in people with ME-CFS from what I've been learning the last few days. So it'd be kind of interesting to see how their uh, glucose behavior uh, changes as well. And there are now continuous glucose monitors. Uh, the one we use is made from Dexcom, that's shown here. There's another one from Abbott that's made, that you put on your, as a patch on your arm, and you wear these things, and they measure your interstitial glucose. And you can follow them, they measure them every five minutes, and you can follow people's glucose patterns. And so, basically, we put these on normal people, and people are pre-diabetic, and what we've discovered is that there's a lot of people running around who are spiking like mad who have no idea, meaning their glucose goes up a lot. Uh, and they don't realize it. And I was one of those people. Actually, mine goes through the roof. I'm a severe spiker, so to speak. So we can start classifying people by their glucose spikes. And so just to put this in perspective, what we've done is we've written some algorithms where we can see how much people are spiking in a systematic fashion. And then we can classify people into what we call glucotypes. People are not much spikers. Those are low glucotypes, moderate spikers, or sort of middle range, and they're severe spikers. And again, I'm a severe spiker. When I eat something like a banana, my glucose will go through the roof. And by the way, that changes with different people. And in fact, what we've done is we put people on different diets, they would see that people will spike to different foods. And a lot of that's thought to be due to your microbiome from the work of Aaron Siegel. Uh, and our data confirms that, although I'd say there's some other factors in that as well. And so different people will spike to different foods. So some people will spike to protein bars, others to bread and peanut butter, and so on and so forth. And one thing, just to warn you, is that nearly everybody, 80% of people, spike to cornflakes and milk. 
So cornflakes and milk are like poison, and I think they're worse than smoking, if you want my opinion, <laughs> because this stuff just sends your glucose right through the roof. So uh, I'm going to make a little editorial that we should ban this stuff. I think it's just <laughs> really not so good. All right, uh, this is a little complicated, but the bottom line is there are people running around who, uh, who are actually spiking just as much as diabetics who are normal by their fasting glucose, something called hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of like how much glucose you have in steady state, and also something called an oral glucose tolerance set. They're normal by all those assays, but they're still spiking just as much as diabetics. And I think it has to do with how we assay glucose. And so I think this is something to be aware of. I have no idea how this relates to MECFS, but I think it would be something interesting to pursue. I guarantee for those of you, who, whether you in that category or not, this is something probably important to know, given the current di diabetic epidemic. All right, so uh, how are we doing all this information and what's next? So we think the smartphone, I'll show you this in a minute, is going to be the most important health tool for you in the future. And so what we've done is we've written algorithms, set up a dashboard that will actually start drawing in in an agnostic fashion. We don't care what smartwatch it is bring in your information into your smartphone so you can actually follow this, what's going on in real time. So we can follow your heart rate, your, you know, your blood oxygen, what have you, even your microbiome. We'll bring in the clinical data as well. We're working on microsampling methods to be able to bring in high frequency other kinds of data as well. And then you can follow this at whatever resolution you want. Hourly resolution, daily, you just click on it and, and expand out. Uh, and so on and so forth. So you can see how your, your physiological parameters are tracking and how they correlate with one another. Um, the way we want to use this in this group, we want to do two kinds of studies that are both IRB approved, and we're collaborating with AMI and some others here to actually hopefully execute all this. But one study is actually to study when people first get sick from a viral infection because their heart rate goes up. So we've written an app that basically you would download you can enroll in the study. Basically, what will happen is you wear a smartwatch. You have to bring your own for now. When we get some money, we'll figure out how to get them out to folks with a Fitbit or an Apple Watch. I don't know how well it'll work for a Fitbit because they're low resolution, but we're going to try it. And basically, what we'll do is when your heart rate goes up, you just basically press on the app when you think you're ill. And we'll track that. And we'll, we're going to follow your resting heart rate. And then we'll see when we think you're getting ill. And that's the first stage of the study. Second stage, we're going to tell you when we think you're getting ill, OK? Because your heart rate's running up. Now, if you're watching a scary movie, and you, we say your heart rate's up, you can probably ignore it. Doesn't mean you're um, probably something bad's happening. But if you're listening to boring Mike Snyder and your heart rate goes up, you're probably really getting ill. You're not. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's not, nothing like that going on. So anyway, that's how we want to roll that one out. The other one we want to roll out is we're approved for Lyme disease, uh, but we're trying to modify this for chronic fatigue syndrome, folks. We basically want to follow people's, um, track them. And actually, you would flag your so-called good days and your not so good days. We were trying to write personal. We have this for some other parts of a different study. We're trying to write personal algorithms. So we can track people's parameters, like how much activity leads to a good day or a bad day. Basically, we call them features. All the different things that would be associated with good or bad, and they can be set up in a time-delayed fashion, meaning if you do something one day and two days later you crash, we would be able to flag that. And we learn, try and learn from this. It might take time. We don't know how much data we're going to need to set up these personal learning models, but that's the goal. And I, we, we've written some rudimentary things now, but that would be the goal to actually set up personal management tools, not just for chronic fatigue syndrome folks, but for everyone would be the goal. Because I think the way we track health and um, illness these days is actually very Byzantine. So that's how we want to change medicine. So once again, I think your smartphone is going to be more important than your doctor for capturing information and being able to, I'm sure I offended a few people here, and that's OK. Um, <laughs> So anyway, but we think it can capture information. Think about it. You really can capture and learn from this information at a level that's never been possible before. And that's really the goal. But it's not really to exclude the physician. In fact, it's really meant to share with the physician who can help better manage your health as well. And so lastly, this is what I see as Mike Snyder's world. I do see a world where people will be getting their sequence, their genome sequence before they're born. Obviously not us. 
but uh, we will track other kinds of omics information uh, where devices that can track our health all the time. I'd love to be able to better track our environmental exposures and then better manage health. Now, I've been very fortunate not only to have amazing advisors like Ron and our advisor and Norman Davidson, but I have amazing people in my lab and the ones who have been very involved in this study are the ones in the bottom right. So Shally, Jesse Dunn, and Dennis Salins have really led the wearable study in our lab. Uh, we've had some talented folks like Amir Bamani, who's built this personal health dashboard that we think will be very valuable. So that's it and happy to talk with folks later. <laughs>